Welcome to the Taped Podcast, the most disappointing podcast in the world. We are your hosts, as always, myself, Mickey T. And me, Nostalgia. And welcome to the November recap, where we recap noteworthy releases that came out over the course of November. We have a couple from October as well. And I think it's safe to say this is going to be the last recap of the year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Self-explanatory. I think we should just stop wasting time, get right into it. Mm -hmm. First album we're going to be talking about today is uh, Songs by Adrian Lenker. This is the fourth studio album from the Indiana singer-songwriter and frontwoman of Big Thief, Adrienne Lenker, and Adrienne's latest solo album was dropped alongside her album Instrumentals, which consisted of like serene, ambient folk pieces, but in contrast with this album's songs, uh, this album is centred more around just being a focused singer-songwriter album, and to say the least, Adrienne makes quite the interesting listen, and she makes one of the most notable singer-songwriter records of the year. I think Adrienne vocally has uh, Adrienne vocally has always stood out to me with her unique voice, and she doesn't disappoint on here vocally as her soft crooning is quite soothing alongside these minimal acoustic instrumentals, all of which are quite blissful, comforting, and warm. I love the organic ambience provided with it too. It adds uh, quite a bit to the sound, and it just goes to show the simple format of a guitar and a voice is really timeless, and all that's really necessary to make a great record. Mm. Songwriting-wise, songwriting Adrienne is as intimate as uh, you'd like, with focuses on heartbreak, longing, and reminiscing, all with brutal honesty too. All of these elements combine in the best of ways, really, making this one of the most like comforting records of the year, I'd say. And I'm glad I like this, because I haven't listened to a whole lot of Big Thief, ex- except their most recent album. But I'm incentivized to check out more, and Adrienne's solo work, because this was really great, in my opinion. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. Um, I've always been a fan of Big Thief and, you know, Adrian's voice was a lot of what makes Big Thief so special, like their atmosphere and their emotion and intimacy is just unmatched and Adrian's vocals are are perfect for that kind of sound. And here, um, it's kind of a similar thing to a lot of Big Thief projects. Um, you know, it's a very stripped back, very acoustic oriented, very atmospheric, um, just singer songwriter record with some of the best vocals I've heard all year on any album. Um, Adrian just blows it away in that department, as she always does. Um, songwriting is fantastic. It's intimate. It's just very poignant. The The whole album is just has a very autumn kind of feel to it. And, you know, everyone knows that autumn is the prettiest month. So that kind of um, attribute really works for the album. Um, you know, it's if if you're a fan of Big Thief, if you're a fan of her previous solo work, then there's absolutely nothing here that would you know turn you away from it or not interest you because it, it's a lot of what we've kind of become used to but you know the pretty the prettiness and the the atmosphere and just the beauty of this album is it, it's unmatched yeah i agree okay the best tracks for me off of songs are anything zombie girl not a loss just forever heavy focus and forwards beck and rebound mm-hmm. My least favorite track is To Reverse and Dragon Eyes, and I gave this album a light 8. My favorite tracks were To Reverse, uh, Anything, Forwards, Beck, and Rebound, Not A Lot, Just Forever, and Dragon Eyes. My least favorite track was Heavy Focus, and I gave this album a decent 8 out of 10. Off to a great start already, and we're not even in November. (laughs) (laughs) Alright, next we have the self-titled album from Food House. This is the debut project from producer Goopy and Fraxium. Uh, is it Goopy or Guppy? I'm always confused on how to pronounce that. I say I say Goopy. I don't think I don't think there's okay. any scholar that's going to correct us for saying either one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm familiar with uh, Goopy's work as uh, he dropped an album earlier this year titled None, which uh, I personally think is a pretty great and wild bubblegum bass album. And I'm pretty unfamiliar with a lot of Fraxium's work, so I don't know much about uh, what they do. With Food House, there's a few things I can admire from it, like the production is pretty good sounding, there's some ideas and songs on here that are creative and pretty brilliant, but ultimately I'm torn on a few things here. I, For one, I feel like a lot of the ideas that were explored on here have are pretty much been done better on other bubblegum bass albums, like... Like, you know, it's mm. somewhat derivative of Dorian Electra and 100 Gex. 
you know, some of them have already done some of these crossovers already. In particular, the metal influences. And it comes off to me as just another bubblegum bass album that lacks its own identity and doesn't really have a whole lot in the way of anything unpredictable or original within its ideas and song structures. I think that performance-wise, there's a bit of work to be done here as a lot of Fraxium's performances were quite lackluster a lot of the time for me. Vocally, I think they're alright. Sometimes they came off a bit awkward, underwritten in terms of songwriting, and at times just messy, and I didn't... And it didn't really help the production at all. It has some bops, but ultimately I don't think it's overly that interesting or well-groomed of an album. Um, yeah, this album is definitely a bit sloppy and a bit all over the place. But it's, to me personally, very charming. I don't know why this album is... I just found it so much fun. Um, and, you know, I thought that this fun was kind of like wane as i listen to it a bit more but after a few listens it's it's still just as good as the first time i heard it personally it's such a roller coaster of just really unrestrained and off kilter ideas glued together by this very infectious and catchy attitude from um uh, fraxium is it yeah fraxium yeah and you know that the chemistry between the two is just really evident here they just sound like they're having a blast on every single track and it's 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 it, personally is a is really fun to listen to even though I, I can't acknowledge that it's definitely not a perfect release and definitely has its faults especially on the latter half of the album there are one or two tracks there where it just to me personally feels like the album kind of loses a little self-awareness and becomes a little a little confused in what it's supposed to be um but overall i just a lot of the tracks especially on the front half of this thing are just so much fun that i, I can't help but like them Fair enough. Um, my favourite tracks are Most Thoser, Curses, and Foresight. My least favourite tracks are Pharmacy, One You Know, and Eight Now, and I gave this album a light six. Uh, my favourite tracks were Soul, Ride, Eight Now, 51129, One You Know, Most Thoser, and Curses. My least favourite tracks were Clown Nose and Foresight, and I gave this album a decent seven. Next we have Disco by Kylie Minogue. This is the 14th studio album from the legendary pop veteran Kylie Minogue, and in a year full of big disco-inspired albums from the likes of Dua Lipa, Jesse Ware, and Roisin Murphy, yet another album is added to the list of notable releases in this style with Kylie Minogue's latest album, which for me is one of the most consistently good albums in this style this year. It's not my personal favourite one in the style, but I think it's great. Well, it borders on great. Now, Kylie isn't new to the disco influence, some of her biggest singles are inspired by disco, but this album goes to show that Kylie Minogue hasn't really lost her touch. Even with uh, Kylie's career spanning over 30 years, she manages to deliver with some really energetic, very fun and charismatic new disco and dance pop tracks that I just can't help but feel like they're just great, I just can't, I could just have such a fun time with them. Production-wise, this album nails the fun disco aesthetic with slick and groovy production that feels so full, rich, and vibrant. It's even better when Kylie is delivering some catchy and charismatic and powerful performances that matches the carefree and danceable production so well. The tracklist itself has so many fun highlights that it's hard to ignore, despite it losing a bit of steam towards the end. I took away so many highlights. I had no expectations for this prior, and I'm glad I got proven wrong this time around, because I'm definitely going to keep listening to this for a fair bit, which I did for a bit now. And yeah, I still think it's a pretty good album. It's a very it's a very <coughs> strong release from Kylie Minogue. Yeah, as, as you said, Disco is another album to come out this year in, you know, well, a disco style. And, you know, as, as much as I do enjoy the style, I, I do... Like, on, on first listen, I, I definitely really connected with this album i definitely had a lot of fun with it but just on consecutive listens it just to me becomes a bit evident evident that there's not really that much to this thing like on uh aside from like a surface level it's just a lot of the instrumentals are you know they have that very pastiche like disco sound to them but below all that they, they are quite basic they're well produced they're pretty solidly put together but there's nothing really to them um, and you know, it's, it's a fun album, but when there's far better releases this year in this exact style and when the style at hand is as at this point getting a bit saturated as it is, 
Um, you know, it's hard for me to really fully connect with this album, even despite, you know, it's, it's great moments. There are some here, some tracks on here that are just a bit redundant to me. I, I feel like I've heard them a, a million times already. Uh, there's nothing really that exciting or just groundbreaking here. It's, it's a fun album, but it's nothing more than that. Yeah, fair enough. My favourite tracks were Miss a Thing, Supernova, Say Something, Real Groove, and Monday Blues. My least favourite track was Dance Floor Darling, and I gave this album a strong 7. Um, I, uh, My favourite tracks were Magic, Miss a Thing, Supernova, and I Love It. My least favourite tracks were Monday Blues and Where Does the DJ Go, and I gave this album a light 6 out of 10. Next, we have Emergency Tsunami by Nav. This is the fourth mixtape from the Canadian rapper and alt r b artist, and this is the third project that Nav has dropped this year, as earlier on he dropped his Good Intentions album, which I think is his best project, but it's just okay. And by okay, it's basically a masterpiece for Nav's standards. You know, then he drops some of his worst stuff after that with Brown Boy 2, which was basically the deluxe version of that album, but it's just, it's just so vapid and boring, much like a lot of Nav's music. His latest mixtape mm. here, unsurprisingly, is a lot like his other projects, bland, monotonous, and boring. It's so safe that, it's. I think it's safe to say that, you know, this mixtape won't cause much of a tsunami, but rather a tiny wave <laughs> in the kiddie pool. Like, <laughs> Wheezy handles everything on the production end of things, and I like Wheezy. He makes some incredibly smooth and psychedelic trap beats that are at this point his signature style. And he does carry a lot of the at uh, this mixtape in general, but uh, I just but he works with so many bland artists that it's insulting. Like he wastes some incredible beats on some of the biggest snoozer artists in trap today. One of them being fucking Nav, who unsurprisingly is the <laughs> worst thing about this album. As always, his flows are basic. His voice is boring. It's flat. It's awful. His bars are terrible and simple. It's a migraine-inducing. He ruins a lot of the great beats on here, although the beats do get a bit predictable later on, and he has little to no memorable presence on any of these, and you know it's bad when Lil Baby has the most interesting verse on the whole album. Production-wise, you know, this is one of Nav's best albums, but either way, it's just another project put alongside the plethora of half-assed, lazy, boring trap albums of recent memory. You know, I had hoped that Nav would go somewhere at least after Good Intentions, which was actually an okay album, but the regression is already in motion, which... I don't know, I, I shouldn't care at this stage, yeah. In general, <laughs> Nav, bad. Yeah. Um, the most insightful thing I can possibly say about this new Nav project is that it's not his worst, which also is not saying a lot in the slightest. Um, I really don't know what I can possibly say about this thing that, you know, I can't say about any of his previous records. Nav is fucking boring. He's got no talent. He... Re realistically he has no potential I don't think I think we're silly to ever expect a good Nav album it just won't really happen given you know what he does even with production uh, like maybe or oh, maybe like it'll, it'll be an album that has just groundbreaking incredible production but as as this album here is, pr is proof that production does not help Nav because Wheezy's production is actually quite good on a lot of these tracks Nav just fucking butchers them. He completely fucking... His voice his just doesn't work. It just does not work. I cannot think of a single scenario where it, it would genuinely work for a full-length project. Maybe there's the odd track or two that I find enjoyable, but there's just no way that any, any Nav project is ever going to be great, in my opinion. Um, also, very confusing that this album ends with, you know, news report of the Japanese tsunami, which is one of the biggest disasters of the last decade it's almost like nav is self-aware and being like yeah this project's a fucking disaster <laughs> <laughs> this is very fitting to end a nav project um but yeah as i said Weasley does have some quality moments here that definitely make the album less shit um but nav just nav is nav there's nothing else to say about that yeah yeah uh, the best tracks are Don't Need Friends and Vetement Socks. The worst tracks are Young Wheezy and Nasty. And I gave this uh, album a decent three. Uh, my favorite tracks were um, Friends and Family. My least favorite tracks were Nasty, Trains, and Turn and Twist. 
and I give this album a light to decent three. Next, we have Power Up by ACDC. This is the 18th album from the long-running Australian hard rock band, and at this stage, ACDC are probably one of my least favorite classic rock bands. Like, when I was younger, I liked a, a fair few ACDC songs, the bigger one, like the big singles. But as I got older and started hearing more, I began to realize, like, wow, these guys just make the exact same song every time, just in a different key. And who knows, some of the songs off this album could have been made 30 years ago and no one would have known. And uh, I don't have anything else to say, I just have to say either way, this album isn't very good, it's boring, it's monotonous, it's repetitive, at times it's really grating, especially in the vocals, the riffs sound the same, the drumming is the same, all the same. <laughs> um, yeah, like... I've even less to say about this album than I did about the Nav one because it's an ACD album in 2020. It's the same thing they've released over and over again, but with a different title and different cover. It's uninteresting, it's uninspired, it's unremarkable, it's unmemorable, it's certainly unoriginal. It's every single term that begins with an un that you can think of. Uh, it's, there's just, I cannot give one reason why you should listen to this thing. Uh, unless you just really fucking are desperate to listen to the same album that you've heard about a dozen times already. Um, yeah, there's just nothing <laughs> nothing of note about this album. Yep. Uh, best track is Realize, and everything else isn't very good or memorable, and this album's a strong three. Um, my f- I don't know how to pick a f- least favorite and favorite track when they all sound <laughs> the same. <laughs> I give this album a light three. Alright, moving on, we have Spirit World Field Guide by Aesop Rock. This is the 8th album from the New York rapper, and the last thing we heard from Aesop was his collaborative album with Tobacco entitled Malibu Ken, which I thought was a pretty great album and one of the best hip-hop albums of 2019. But as far as solo albums, the last thing we heard from him was The Impossible Kid, which I think is his best album. With uh, this new album, I wasn't sure as to what I would expect from him, as this thing is 21 songs and at over an hour's length, but after listening to it, I could say that it has merit to it. I don't see myself returning to it a whole lot, but I do like this album. I don't think it's amazing, I don't think it's groundbreaking for Aesop Rock at this stage, but, you know, it's 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 a good Aesop Rock album, I think. You know, it's uh, Aesop Rock at his usual with his eclectic flows, his obscure metaphorical lyrics, and his conceptual prowess. The production is essentially the same as we'd normally expect from him with the hardcore hip-hop sound with this kind of sci-fi aesthetic and there's really a moment where Aesop Rock sounds out of place or uncomfortable. Quite the opposite actually, but I do have issues with it. I like it, but it is bloated, no questions asked. A fair amount of these songs are just unmemorable, getting lost in the highs and I feel like Aesop's whole shtick gets tiring, especially after like fucking, maybe after like 13 tracks. While I don't find uh, it, f- well, let me say that again. While I don't, you know, find for a few tracks his delivery. What am I even saying here? My notes are just terrible. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, fair. I'll just I'll just end on this. I like a, I like this album, but it just um it's self indulgent, might I say? Mm. Yeah. I'll be honest, I was, I'm was i a fan of Aesop Rock, I, I definitely love his style, but this album was a bit disappointing to me. It's not bad, you know, especially when it comes to a lot of Aesop Rock's performances, and obviously lyricism, he's he's always been a very talented lyricist, there's no denying that, he's a fantastic wordsmith, and that definitely carries into this new album, but where the album really loses me is, is a lot of the production, most of it is very synthetic to me personally, and it's quite tiring overall especially considering the length of this project. It's just quite hard to latch onto some of these beats and stay interested in anything here, and this album's length, you know, doesn't really help that fact in the slightest. It is quite a long project. Um, there's there's nothing here that's, like, straight up bad, but pretty much everything is just in the range of fine. It's not nothing special. It's nothing groundbreaking. You know, Aesop Rock's performances are actually pretty, you know, pretty catchy, pretty engaging. It's just the production that just kind of falls flat and the album overall becomes a little repetitive, a little redundant, and a little self-indulgent. Fair enough. Um, My favourite tracks from Spirit World Field Guide are Button Masher, Gauze, 
Pizza Alley, Crystal, Crystal Sword, Holy Waterfall, Salt, and Sleeper Car. My least favorite track is Side Quest, and I gave this uh, album a decent 7. My favorite tracks were Gauze, Crystal Sword, Salt, The Four Winds, and my least favorite track was Dog at the Door, and I gave this album a decent 5 out of 10. Next, we have Starting Over by Chris Stapleton. This is the fourth album from the country singer-songwriter, and I'm very new to Chris's music, as this is the first project I've ever heard from him. And all I have to say is that I was pleasantly surprised by this album, as in the grander scheme of country that's released in 2020, this is possibly the peak of country in 2020, and it's probably my favourite country release of the year. A lot, of, a lot of modern country, to say the least, is in a dire state, but there are a few artists in the genre that manage to make it fresh and tolerable, and Chris Stapleton is one of those people, as his sound and his style is honestly pretty refreshing for me, as his style is authentic and poignant, especially with a lot of songwriting, and his voice is very powerful, gruff, and strong as hell, with the equally strong inter- instrumentals. His blends of outlaw and traditional country sound fantastic, and there's some incredibly invigorating production on this thing that just sounds fantastic, and a lot of the songwriting is pretty great as well, so that's something. This album isn't amazing though, I do feel like some songs aren't as good as I'd want them to be, and I feel like sometimes the songwriting can just fall into the pastiche of generic country, but honestly, I had a blast with this album overall. I took away some brilliant tracks, and I'm interested in checking out the rest of uh, Chris Stapleton's discography. Um, yeah, Chris Stapleton, time and time again, you know, proved that he's one of the most talented, um, introspective and, and quality acts in modern country. And on starting over, you know, an album that's filled to the brim with incredibly well-written, passionate songs and very tightly performed country tracks, you know, he really proves that yet again. Um, you know, I've always felt like Chris Stapleton's music is just has a very endearing quality to it. And this album, again, proves exactly that. And... It's just a very heartwarming, very uplifting, very just enjoyable listen. His voice is fantastic. The instrumentals just are really great. They're really tight. Nothing, you know, groundbreaking in terms of country, but it's, you know, the quality is there and, like, the songwriting just delivers on every front. Um, Yeah, I really like this album. It might not be his best. Um, I have to re-listen to some of his older projects, but it's definitely... One of the best country albums I've heard this year, I think. For me, it's personally between this and Jason Isbell. Um, Yeah, I really like this album. Alright, my favourite tracks from Starting Over are Cold, Watch You Burn, Arkansas, Devil Always Made Me Think Twice, Hillbilly Blood, and Nashville, Tennessee. My least favourite tracks are Worry Be Gone and You Should Probably Leave, and I gave this album a strong 7. My favorite tracks were Starting Over, Cold, When I'm With You, Arkansas, Hillbilly Blood, Maggie's Song, Old Friends, and Nashville, Tennessee. My least favorite tracks uh, track was You Should Probably Leave, and I gave this album a strong 7 out of 10. Next we have Pluto x Baby Pluto by Future and Lil Uzi Vert. This is the latest collaborative effort from one of some of Trap's most beloved rappers, Future and Lil Uzi Vert. Now, going into this album, I was pretty skeptical, as I think both artists aren't all that great. They both have at least one album or mixtape that I like, but besides that, I don't care for a lot of their work. They also both dropped albums this year. Uzi dropped Eternal Take, which I overhyped when it came out, but since then, I think it's pretty mediocre. And Future came out with High Off Life, which is, in my opinion, one of his most messy albums. Now, with this album, I'd hope for the best and that Future and Uzi Styles would mesh well together, but knowing Future's track record with collab albums, it'll be a mess, and I was right, this thing is just such a nothing album, in my opinion. It's really sloppy, it's so generic, and it's just really boring. They came together on this new album and made made one of the most boring experiences I've had all year. Like, they could have at least sounded like they made made this with care, but, nah, they just half ass the entire thing. Production-wise, this album is fine, I guess. It's just tedious and generic, by the numbers and one-dimensional. Like, there's so little you can do when all these beats sound so similar to each other. Like, you know, at least add some color to them, or variety. You know, Future and Uzi don't really complement each other very well. Their chemistry is all over the place. Their performances are repetitive, very sloppy, and... You'd think with these guys' respective styles that they would mesh well together, but on here, no, they do not. They don't complement each other in the slightest, and 
with this thing being 16 tracks you'd hope there'd be at least a little bit of um little bit of that but unfortunately it just turns into an absolute snooze snooze fest that's only purpose is to exist and fulfill the trap me the mediocre trap niche that's all i have to say mm. well um i have a bit of a hot take you know i'm i'm certainly not a fan of future I'm not really that big on Le Luzi Vert, but for some reason I quite enjoyed this <laughs> project and I seem to be the only person. Um I don't know I am um, I don't know how to really explain myself. I just had a lot of fun with the you know, I definitely expected to hate this thing, I I'll be honest. But when I was just sitting to it, I kinda lost myself and the production is a bit, you know, samey, but the production just has this very ethereal quality to it that I I just find quite interesting and a lot of you know that alone really you know grabbed me and entranced me in a lot of these tracks but you know I'll admit that Future and Uzi's verses are sometimes quite nonsensical and weird and redundant and dumb but a lot of the time they just you know they have this energy and fun to them that just I don't know does this weird thing to me where it just makes me feel excited and um, just relaxed and kind of transports me to some weird fucking alien dimension where this is i don't know i don't know what i'm trying to say some weird alien trap dimension and i end up i don't know i just really enjoyed a lot of what was on this project i enjoyed um the production i think that future and uzi were infectious a lot of the time i admit that it's not groundbreaking or it's not anything that is traditionally fantastic but personally i just found this really fun and really transcendental trans English <laughs> and just a really transcending release and I really liked it transcendental what the fuck was that <laughs> well this was surprising honestly <laughs> I thought yeah, out of all of these myself. you just uh, for, <laughs> out of all of these releases we're talking about I thought with this album in particular you'd have so little to say about it I don't know it's just it does some it's just does something weird to my brain I can't really explain it as as you could probably tell I just, I found it like really weirdly like nostalgic and just hypnotizing. Um, okay then. It wasn't um, great. <laughs> I just enjoyed it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I think the best tracks from this album are "Stripes Like Burberry," "Sleeping on the Floor," and "Lullaby." I don't like the other tracks. They're all they all sound the same, and I gave this album a strong three. My favorite tracks were Stripes Like Burberry, Drinking and Smoking, Million Dollar Play, Plastic, That's It, and Lullaby. My least favorite tracks were Bought a Bad, Bought a Bad Bitch, uh, and I Don't Want to Break Up, and I gave this album a decent to strong six. Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, next we have So Help Me God by 2 Chains. This is the fifth studio album from the Atlanta rapper, and... I was kind of hyped for this album as I personally really like Two Changes' last album, uh, Rapper Go to the League. The you know this album for me is probably Two Chains Two Chains best and one of his most interesting albums in terms of production and lyrics as he seems to have a fair bit of topical focus on that album. With this new album, I was hoping for some progression, but ultimately this album is just a regression for me as it's pretty disappointing for me. While I don't think it's bad. It just has so many issues that make it one of the most lackluster albums in 2 Chainz's discography. For one, the production is some of the most uninteresting he's ever been on. Sometimes the beats are cool, but most of them are just very forgettable. 2 Chainz isn't really delivering on a lot of the charisma that he showed on his last album. He has some humorous moments and some very heartfelt cuts, which are actually really good. But all in all, it's probably one. It's probably the most uninteresting thing about this album as a whole. I just don't have much else to say about it. Like... It's just disappointing for me. It just comes off as just an, another trap album. Yeah, it's. I think this project has its moments, especially on the back end of this thing. But ultimately, you know, far too much of this album was just, to put it bluntly, quite trash. Uh, the production is often very rugged, very uninspired, and just sometimes even like plain hard to listen to. Um, Two Chains delivers a lot of what. A lot of what you may expect from him, like pretty harmless, you know, quite goofy bars. But there's times on this project where it's just so dumb that it's hard to even laugh at, like, you know, on the track gray area. Um, you know, I don't I don't know what else to say. This album just feels very substanceless, very 
forced in a lot of its, you know, goofiness and, you know, that, that signature uh, two chains kind of humor. And it's overall quite uninspired. Fair enough. My favorite tracks were Can't Go For That, Feel Away, Ziploc, Southside Hove, Vampire, and 55 Times. The worst tracks are Moneymaker, YRB, Free Liar, Lambo Wrist, Tony, and Wait For You To Die, and I gave this album a 5. Uh, my favorite tracks were Feel Away, Vampire, Grey Area, Save Me, Moneymaker, and Free Lighter, and I gave this album a light to a decent 3. Next we have Lamentations by William Bzinski. This is the 17th studio album from the long-running producer, and this is my first exposure to William's music, and I have to say, I enjoyed the, this a fair bit. I, I'd love to check out more of his stuff. As for as far as Lamentations goes, I'm impressed by a lot of the production on this album, as the droney and dark ambient soundscapes are covered in just interesting and captivating textures over these repetitive samples, and it just sounds very well done to me. It has plenty of interesting st- songs in its track list that I could see myself returning to overall, but I don't find it completely consistent as there are a couple of tracks that I feel like are self-indulgent and not very captivating, unlike some of the best tracks on this. I don't really have much else to say. I, I don't think there is much else to say. I just think it's a pretty pretty good uh, dark ambient record. Yeah, when I look back at some of my favorite um, William Bozinski projects, like the iconic Disintegration Loops or t- even 2017's A Shadow in Time, part of what I love about those albums is the just sheer length and scale of the music. And, you know, length is what made the tape drones so, you know, entrancing. You would never be able to, like, fully capture the evolution or rather the devolution of the opening track to Disintegration Loops if it wasn't any shorter than 40 minutes. You know, just uh, the repetitiveness and just the uneasiness of how the music changes was always, like, one of the best things about his loops and why they were just so magical. And, you know, I didn't really know how to feel about, you know, this new project being filled with, you know, rather short pieces. But ultimately, I think it still managed to be very entrancing and beautiful, but in like bite-sized chunks. It doesn't really live up to some of his best works overall, but it does feel like, you know, this is your first William Bozinski project, which I, I think definitely works because it does feel like a good entry point into his music. It does really give you a taste of what he's about, but as I said, in very small chunks. And, you know, it's it, it kind of prepares you for albums like The Disintegration Loops and A Shadow in Time, which are incredible pieces of work. And this one, it's, I wouldn't call it incredible, but it's, it's certainly very good. All right. My favorite tracks were Oh My Daughter, Oh My Sorrow, Passio, Please, This Shit Has Got to Stop, and Transfiguration. My least favorite tracks were Silent Spring and For Whom the Bell Tolls, and I gave this album a light 7. Uh, my favorite tracks were The Wheel of Fortune, Tear Vile, Oh My Daughter, Oh My Sorrow, Passio, All These Two I I Love, and Silent Spring. Was my, Oh no, and my least favorite was Silent Spring, sorry. And I give this track right. uh, album, uh, I give this album <laughs> a strong 7. Alright. Next, we have 2000 and Forever by Brie Runaway. This is the debut studio mixtape from the UK rapper, and this is my first exposure to her music as her, and you know, her debut mixtape was garnering a lot of attention on album of the year, and it was getting pretty great buzz, and I was excited to see if this was as good as people were making out to be, but unfortunately, I was left a bit disappointed. Free does show potential on this mixtape though, she manages to pull together some very confident and sassy performances, and she seems capable of putting together a very good song, especially with a couple of tracks on this album, but I feel like what let me down in this album was a lot of the production and the songwriting. I feel like so many of the hooks on this album are very hit or miss, they don't really seem like much like thought was put into them, and they end up sounding kind of tacky or awkward, and I feel like the production wasn't that great either. It does have some nice sequences, but it seems kind of tacky in its blend of pop rap and electro pop. It doesn't really come off to me as anything that memorable, but that being said, I don't think there's a bad song on here. There isn't much of a moment that was terrible, but it just seems lackluster and it could have turned out so much better. Despite my lukewarm, you know, takes, I'm optimistic for Brie as she has potential, honestly. Yeah, honestly, I think 2000 and Forever really plays its best cards quite early um 
you know, a lot of uh, the early tracks here are wild, infectious, memorable, and very, very solid in, on, in the production end of things. But then, you know, once you reach the back end of this thing, it, it's just a lot of the tracks kind of meander and, you know, a lot of them are just quite uninspired. And even though this is a very short album, you know, a lot of a lot of the back end of this project seems quite slow and redundant. Um, you know, there there are some moments that really showcase, you know, how addictive and just wild and crazy uh, Bree's performances can be. Um, and, you know, it definitely showcases a lot of potential from the artist, but I think a lot of that potential, while it does seem like it's going to go somewhere at the start, does kind of get lost later on in this admittedly short project. Um, it's It's definitely fine it's definitely you know for the especially for the first few tracks it's definitely worth listening to but it does kind of just get lost in itself for me personally all right my favorite tracks were the little nokia remix gucci no sir and ape shit my least favorite track was uh, atm and i gave this out mixtape a decent five my favorite tracks were ape shit little nokia and atm my least favorite track was jam daniel and i gave this mixtape a light five out of ten Next, we have Monument by Molchat Doma. I hope I'm saying that right. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the third album from the Belarusian post-punk and cold wave band. And I've never heard of this group before, so I was somewhat unaware of what I was getting myself into until you showed me a track from theirs, which was a pretty cool track, to say the least. Mm. This new album, Monument, does get some things right. And for what it does, it's a pretty decent album, but kind of underwhelming. I liked a handful of tracks on here, mostly because of the front man. The production sounded really good, and everybody involved did a pretty good job, which was the case with the synth-heavy post-punk production. But I feel like where it falls flat in is in where it is dis- where it's distinguishable. Its memorability is it's just not that memorable, since a fair amount of tracks just sound exactly the same and give us just the same mindless and monotonous songs. I enjoy what it does sonically, and there are a few tracks I enjoy, but I could have asked for a bit more and something more interesting in terms of sonic texture. But it's uh, it's decent. Mm. Maybe it's my Polish blood tingling whenever I hear anything Code Wave related, but this new Molchat Doma album, personally, I think was brilliant. Um, possibly even better than their previous album, which was very, very much critically acclaimed. This one isn't really getting that acclaim. But personally, I, I I still enjoy it just as much, even if it is a bit more pop oriented and a bit more just overall synth poppy than their last project. Um, but other than that, it is quite similar to their previous album. You know, at the co- at its core, it's very groovy and infectious bass lines with instrumentation that has an overall very nostalgic and mysterious feel to it, which is largely helped by the very lo-fi and washed out production all over this album. Um, it kind of sounds like something that would be playing in some sort of abandoned Soviet diner in like the 19 fucking 80s. And I fucking love that. This whole aesthetic just, I, I only, I, I don't remember many things at all about Eastern Europe, but this album definitely makes me a little nostalgic of some of the random stuff that I'd remember, like just random sites of commie blocks just all across the horizon and just little weak kiosks with like fags on every corner. And you could buy fucking vodka there as well. Um, <laughs> th- this is what this album reminds me of. And I don't know. It's it's just... I, I love the sound that they go for. Fair enough. But uh, I'm probably going to butcher some of these titles, but fuck it. <laughs> My favorite tracks were Oberchen, Utenot, and Leningradsky Blues. My least favorite tracks were Svedsi, Otveta Net, and Udel Tvoj Nomer. Did I, did I do good? <laughs> did Mick do good? Yeah, as as good as it could. Oh, I don't fuck, speak thanks. Russian, so I'll probably butcher some of these as well. Uh, Autono- oh, least favorite. Did you do least favorite? Yeah, I did. I didn't give my score, though. I gave it oh, like six. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my favorite tracks were Autonut, Obrechen, Discotech, Otvetanet, Zvezdy, Udalit Tvoj Numer, Lubit i Vipolnyat. And my least favorite track was Nishmesno, and I give this album a decent eight out of ten. Okay, no need to flex. <laughs> what a flex dude what an absolute flex what a flex you could pronounce Russian okay dude. <laughs> okay I'm so jealous. 
Ah, the jealousy intensifies. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> next we have Sin Miedo by Kali Uchis. This is the sophomore album from the Virginia singer-songwriter, and Sin Miedo is the follow-up to her acclaimed 2018 album, Isolation, which I completely missed, but I will get to it soon. But every time I've heard Kali Uchis from a single or from a feature, I wasn't disappointed in the slightest, as I enjoyed every performance that I've heard from her. So I was hoping for a good record with Sin Miedo, but I came away lukewarm with this album in particular. I enjoy a few things about what Callie does on this album vocally, she's on point, there's some really good moments of production, and all in all those tracks in particular are done very well, but I feel like there is a fair amount of tracks that are just very unmemorable. Those tracks in particular just sound kind of boring, Callie vocally doesn't complement the production in my opinion, as it only makes it even more monotonous for these tracks in particular. They're well made to be fair, but they're just not that interesting in the slightest, and uh, I could imagine this being a disappointing follow-up to Isolation for a few people, but for now, it's passable. Um, yeah, this this new uh, Kali Uchis album it features a lot of very flavorful and, and colorful tracks. And, you know, obviously overall it has a more Latin flair than Isolation in both, not not only lyrically. Lyrically, it's, it's obviously mostly in Spanish, but... Um, this, the whole sound palette is a lot more exotic, a lot more uh, Latin oriented, and I definitely enjoy that, you know, twist. It's not really a twist, obviously, but I enjoy, you know, yeah. that that pace of the album. And, you know, the production's clean, Kaliuchi sounds fantastic. And even with all that going for it, the album just somehow still, a lot of the time, manages to be quite unmemorable, and a lot of the times quite predictable as well. It just feels like it, it never really pushes itself or tries to escape her comfort zone. It just feels like a very safe project. It, there's a lot of potential, but a lot of the time it feels like it's just, it doesn't really reach reach that potential. It just feels like it's playing, you know, playing its cards safe. It doesn't really do anything groundbreaking that she hasn't done on previous records. Um, but it, that being said, it's still enjoyable to listen to. It's just once you kind of dissect it, you it, there's nothing really to hold on to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, the best tracks for me are Aquí Yo Mando, Vaya Con Dios, Que Te Pedí, uh, Quiero Sentirme Bien, Telepatia, and De Nadi. The worst tracks, in my opinion, are Arguadiente y Limón and Te Pongo Mal. Don't, don't fucking they thought of me because I can't pronounce Spanish, okay? Yeah, I absolutely cannot pronounce Spanish either. Um, my favorite tracks were... Oh, did you do score? Oh, uh, Light 6. Sorry, <laughs> forgot. We forget to... <laughs> twice now, uh, twice. Yeah. Uh, my favorite tracks were Fue Major, Vaya Con Dios, and Telepatia. My least favorite tracks were Aqui Yo Mando and Te Pongo Mal. And my favorite... No, I gave this album a, a decent 5. All right, all right. Apologies to our <laughs> Spanish viewers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Alright, next we have we have KG by King Gizzard and the <clears throat> Lizard Wizard. Not too long ago we did our King Gizzard Worst to Best, which you should uh, check out, by the way. Hell yeah. And I think they've already got another album on the way. Good on you, lads. Good on you. <laughs> so yeah, this is the 16th album from the Australian Psych Rock, Garage Rock, Kraut Rock, Prog Rock, Thrash Metal, Psych Folk, Jazz Rock, Anatonial Rock, etc. band King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard and a band that over the past few months has slowly but surely be become one of my favorite bands ever as there isn't much of a band like King Giz. They've been consistently reinventing themselves with each release having a new concept or a new sound. Like their last two albums went from a light-hearted environmentalist psychedelic boogie rock album to an extreme brand of thrash metal and stoner <clears throat> metal so where can you go wrong with uh, binging this band's discography? And uh yeah, KG sees the band do what many people did this year and make their material during quarantine with this album. And King Giz don't really attempt something new, but rather make a follow-up record to their 2017 album, Flying Microtonal Banana, which is a great record in my opinion and easily one of the band's best. This does seem like a regression stylistically, but I have faith in what King Giz are doing on here. To me, it isn't really that huge in it isn't isn't really that huge of an album in the band's discography. It just feels like they just made another flying microtonal banana with without much consistent excitement as many of the cuts on this album do. 
know, it's pretty standard for King Giz at this stage. I enjoy a fair amount of tracks, though. They still maintain what I like about King Giz in some respects. Sonically, the microtonal sound is done well. A lot of it is quite... Some of it is pretty unmemorable in my opinion, like why would I listen to this album in its entirety over Flying Microtonal Banana? They try something new with the Turkish house inspired Intrasport, and I love the heavy final track which is pretty doomy, and some of the singles grew on me a lot, in particular Straws in the Wind, but besides that, I think that KG is just another version of Flying Microtonal Banana, but a bit unmemorable. I think it's good, it has its fair share of really great tracks, but just a, a fair amount of tracks here just don't really do a whole lot for me. It's Probably one of King Gizzard's unmemorable albums, in my opinion. Um, yeah, when when I heard that they're releasing a new album, and you know they had obviously a lot of time to work on it during quarantine, I was um, definitely expecting to just a uh, hear a new, completely new, fresh idea, something very refined, something very unique. But instead, as you said, we got um, a pretty direct follow up to Flying Microtonal Banana and. It's very microtonal, you know, inspired, and uh, Anatolian, just Turkish rock influences, which is fine. Um, obviously, Flying Microtonal Banana is, like, one of my favorite King Gizzard albums. It's it's an album that I love, I adore the sound of it, and, you know, why would I not want more of it? Uh, but this album here just feels like a very washed out and just uninspired and kind of bland version of Flying Microtonal Banana. It just lacks the punchiness and energy of the of its predecessor, even if it is, you know, very similar aesthetically. Um, it's got some fantastic tracks, don't get me wrong. But, you know, as, as they've already proven, the Anatolian rock influence works really well with King Gizzard's very busy and just off-kilter and experimental sound. And, you know, there's even you know with all that there are tracks on here that are just completely unmemorable they just kind of get lost in themselves and you know it does the, the good tracks are there but it does kind of ruin my enjoyment of the album when a lot of the tracks here are not bad just not very interesting um there's only really one track i don't like and that's straws in the wind for some reason i don't know why that was the um lead single they decided to go with when it's by far the most insignificant and the least interesting. The lead interesting. single was Honey. Was it not? I'm pretty sure it was Straws in the Wind. No, it was Honey. Honey came out first. Oh, I thought they released Straws. Oh, well, my bad. They released I, four I... singles. Oh, well, Straws in the Wind, I, I... That should not have been a single. It's it's like a fucking... It's, it's just a big skip for me. That track is so fucking boring. Um, Everything else is fine or good, but it's it doesn't really live up to... Some of the best works. I thought it was Straws in the Wind because that was the one that was like everywhere. Nah, it's Honey. Maybe it's just because Spotify will just even to this day just it, like recommended for you Straws in the Wind. <laughs> it's been like that for the last three months. I cannot. Fair escape enough. It. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, my favorite tracks from KG are Automation, Minimum Brain Size, Straws in the Wind, Honey, and The Hungry Wolf of Fate. My least favorite tracks are Ontology and Intrasport, and I gave this album a light 7. My favorite tracks were Automation, Minimum Brain Size, and Ontology. My least favorite track was Surprise Surprise, Straws in the Wind, and I give this album a strong 6 out of 10. Alright, next we have Good News by Megan The Stallion. This is the debut studio album from the Texas rapper, and... To say the least, Megan has uh, had a pretty big come up over the past couple of years, in 2020 especially, with some of her biggest and most viral songs today, you know, those being Savage and WAP, which went viral on fucking TikTok, and WAP for being controversial. Up to this point, I've always felt like Megan has some incredible potential as a rapper. She's got the flow, she's got the delivery, the confidence, the personality, and the demeanor. But I feel like her projects left me a bit lukewarm. Fever was a really decent mixtape and her best project in my opinion, but overall it wasn't that consistent. The Sugar EP was pretty underwhelming to me, but I had faith with this new album here, but once again I was left uh, with a bit of a lukewarm uh, reception to this one. Where mm. Megan gets things right though is in a lot of the rapping, obviously. She still brings plenty of character to her songs, she pulls together some of her best tracks to date, like the opener especially. When she's over the right production, I'm having fun with this, but I feel like 
that's where the main issue with this project is. It's the production. While I think there are some really good beats, there are plenty of very trite, forgettable, and bland ones that don't really complement Megan that well and bring down, you know, this album for me. The hooks was another thing that kind of brought the project down for me because some of them were pretty bad and very underwritten. The features are pretty okay, and this album is pretty bloated in my opinion. If the lackluster songs were cut out from this track list, uh, I'd probably like this a lot more, but unfortunately, that, that didn't happen. I was left disappointed. I still think that Megan can make a great project in the future, but good news wasn't that, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, obviously, you know, Megan has a, a fantastic flow and just an overall talent for rapping, you know, as well as a, an unmatched presence on the mic. And when it's utilized correctly alongside, you know, very engaging production, it just some of her best tracks are fantastic and she has potential to be absolutely fantastic. But unfortunately, this album just for me has a lot of bad eggs. Um, either when it comes to the quality of the production or features or even sometimes the the quality or just very tedious performances from Megan. Uh, but it, it's it's usually the production that just kind of is a little boring or underwhelming on a lot of this thing. Megan does have some, you know, sloppy and uninteresting performances here, but I think a lot of the weaker tracks can be kind of attributed to the production end of things. And overall, you know, it, it has some great tracks and it has a lot to hold on to, but it is very inconsistent. Um, and as you said, tracks like Shots Fired and just tracks where Megan overall seems more focused and is, is kind of rapping with a purpose are usually her best tracks. And that first track is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, um, it's, it's a fucking brilliant track. Yeah, but it does kind of lose its quality later on, even though it does have some great tracks still. Yeah. All right, my favorite tracks from Good News are Shots Fired, Circles, Outside, and Savage Remix. My least favorite tracks are Body, Crybaby, Intercourse, and Work That, and I gave this album a light six. My favorite tracks were Shots Fired, Circles, Sugar, Sugar Baby, Freaky Girls, uh, Don't Stop, and Savage Remix. My least favorite tracks was Do It On The Tip, Body, Work That, and Intercourse, and I gave this, uh, I gave this album a light five out of ten. Next we have B by BTS. This is the eighth studio album from the massive K-pop group and this is also the second released from them in 2020. Early on in the year they dropped Mac with the Soul 7 which I thought was a pretty alright album. It was uh, too bloated in my opinion but B is way shorter so I hope for a more concise listen than Map of the Soul 7. But I more or less feel like this is just as okay as an album can be. And everyone involved clearly did well with their respective talents and they got on some pretty pleasant and nice sounding production. But standouts for me are few and far in between as a lot of the tracks are quite forgettable and honestly quite mundane with nothing really that attention grabbing or exciting. I did enjoy the more synth fucking... Synth fuck... (laughs) Synth (laughs) funk. Synth (laughs) funk. That sounds like some sort of like hardcore synth punk genre. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds like fucking it sounds like what cut the crap sounds like <laughs> anyway fuck, i did more sense <laughs> that should be the name of uh, our band synth fuck synth fuck all right <laughs> <laughs> i did enjoy the more synth funk inspired tracks and i really love dynamite but aside from that the r&b stuff was quite bland with that being said none of this is bad it isn't as bad as some people are making it out to be It's a decent album, and whether you hate this group and their toxic fan base or not, you can't deny that these guys are incredibly talented and capable. And, you know, they make fun, catchy music, which, you know, they do a lot of the time on here. But, yeah, all in all, I enjoyed enjoyed a fair amount of it, but it isn't that memorable, in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah, it's not my favorite uh, synth fuck release of the year. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, you know, say what you will about the quality of some of their music or their very um, rabid fan base, especially on Twitter. It's impossible to deny that the BTS lads are very talented and definitely have a, a passion for music and, and definitely love music. Um, unlike, you know, it, it doesn't really feel that way with some pop artists. They, they do feel genuinely passionate about their stuff. And B, you know, it's, it reminds me of a lot of their better works. Um and a lot of it is just very well performed simple short and sweet pop um you know that sees every member pretty much um play to their strengths 
and showcases a very great energy and fun charisma. And you know, there's there's obvious duds here. However, especially in the try uh, in the track "Stay," which features a very bombastic and explosive EDM instrumental, which is very overbearing and just ruins the pace of the track list for me overall. Um, but there are some great tracks on here. The production is generally very enjoyable, very pristine, and you know, tracks like "Dynamite" or uh, "Life Goes On" are tracks that I definitely come back to. What's your favorite synth fuck track? Synth fuck, dude. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's why I come up with a joke. <laughs> um, synth fuck. The one with the synths. Uh, Blinding Lights NSFW Remix. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs know. to make that, please. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, my favorite track from B was Dynamite. My least favorite track was Stay, and I gave this album a light six. Uh, my favorite tracks were uh, Life Goes On, Blue and Grey, Telepathy, Disease, and Dynamite. My least favorite track was Stay, and I gave this album a light seven out of ten. Next, we have Origins of the Alimonies by Liturgy. This is the fifth album from the experimental and avant garde black metal outfit. Now, I've heard about Liturgy before, I've heard great things, might I add, and with this new album's release, I was hoping for something really good to live up to my expectations, but personally, I wasn't very keen on what Liturgy did on here. I don't really know what to make of this album. On one hand, I respect what, it album, what this album tries to achieve with its avant-garde nature. There are some pretty solid moments in its tracklist, and on and on, it sounds good. But a lot of this just seems like a forced aesthetic, and by that I mean it's avant-garde for the sake of being avant-garde. Not much of what liturgy does on here like interests me for the most part, nothing really sticks with me, and it feels like monotony to the next degree. It mostly fails at trying to build up to something great and worthwhile, with a lot of these tracks not having much of a direction or a gratifying payoff from some of these build-ups, and some of it this just borders on wankery for me. It's clear that they it, it it's kind of clear that they were a bit clueless with what they wanted to do on this album and that rubs off on me when I listen to it as it just leaves me wondering like what are they even trying to achieve and what was the purpose of this like you know it's still a bit of an interesting listen but besides that I don't get much out of this album personally um I'll get to this in more detail in a second but I but I do agree I, I think this album does meander quite a bit and it does seem quite lost and clueless at some point But there are points here where I think the very slow burning and building flow of the album is very well executed. I think the production and the glitchy aspects are brilliant a lot of the time. And especially when they're well executed, they they definitely leave an impression on me. Um, You know, as this is a metal album, it does feature some of your usual metal instrumentation, if you can call it that. And while it is quite scarce on this thing, any time it does come in, it does hit quite hard. Um, Same applies to Hunter's vocals. Um, you know, they're quite scarce, but when she does show up on the tracks here, um, definitely leaves a lasting impression. And, you know, the vocals are brilliant, they're intense in the media. And I just wish she was featured vocally a, a lot more on this album, because um, there are there are definitely, as I mentioned, points where this album just is a little slow, and it could use a bit more of that um, just very wild nature to them. Um, yeah, I, I, do, I do think that... The, the more meandering and more slow and just kind of self, um, kind of, what's indulgent. the word? Self-indulgent, just moments on this album do bring it down quite a lot. But there are definitely plenty of moments here that are well worth listening to and well worth visiting. And, you know, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of um, Hack either. Um, I think they're both around, uh, I think for similar reasons. I mean, if you if you really enjoyed their previous album, you, you you may very well enjoy this, but it just doesn't do all that much to me. Come to like make me completely love it, but there are definitely moments that I do uh, very much enjoy. Yeah, um, my favorite tracks from Origins of the Alimonies are the Fall of uh, Sayahim. I, I really hope I'm saying these right, and the well, Armistice. Probably aren't, and that's that's probably the point. <laughs> probably. My least favorite tracks are Oyoyan's Birth and Simon's Lament, and I gave this album a strong four. My favorite tracks were The Separation of Hack, 
Robin Hale, Lonely Oyoyon, Apparition of the Eternal Church, The Armistice, and my least favourite track was Shaman's Lament. And I gave this album a light to, no, a decent to a strong 6 out of 10. Yeah, that's about as close as we'll get to pronouncing anything <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> Alright, we have two more albums left. Next we have Plastic Hearts by Miley Cyrus. This is the seventh studio album from one of the biggest stars of the last decade, and Miley Cyrus at this stage doesn't really need much of an introduction. She's back with her latest album, and for me personally, Miley has always been pretty mediocre with a lot of her music. It just doesn't really land with me personally, and I wasn't expecting much going into this new album, Plastic Hearts, and honestly, I thought this was surprisingly decent, and I'm confident in saying that this is probably Miley Cyrus's best album. Much like what many artists throughout 2020 have done, Miley is hitting us with a lot of callbacks to older music styles and nostalgia, in particular the 80s, as many of these tracks on the many of these tracks on the album embrace sounds of new wave and pop rock, and for the most part, it's decent. Granted, there are things I don't enjoy about this album, like most of Miley Cyrus's per- performances vocally. The lyrics are cheesy, and you know the track with jo- Joan Jett is legitimately awful. But besides that, some of these tracks are quite good. The production is decent, Miley does well with a fair amount of moments on here, and there's a surprisingly good Billy Idol appearance on the album. All (laughs) in all, it's just a surprisingly decent album from Miley Cyrus, her best work, but at the same time it doesn't really do much to stand out, and, you know, Miley's vocals aren't that great. But, you know, it's fine. I'll take it or leave it. Yeah, people generally seem to be quite liking this uh, new Miley Cyrus album, which I definitely cannot see, because there are definitely points on a lot of this album where I I just find it completely intolerable. There are some okay tracks, mostly in the midsection of this thing, but they're usually the more low-key and atmospheric, uh, atmospheric tracks, which I think Miley Cyrus does somewhat decently pull off. But a lot of, you know, the more rock-influenced tracks on here are just fucking horrid. Um, the, four, uh, the first four tracks just are some of the worst tracks I've heard all year, back to back to back. I absolutely fucking despised every single one of them. Uh, Miley's vocals are awful. I genuinely... They, they, they're they decent on some of the softer things, but when she's doing the very kind of Joan Jett-inspired rock riot girl, whatever the hell she's trying to even pull off, it just sounds so unbearable to me. Um, the ideas here just sound so tired, so uninteresting... The whole album is just so damn predictable. There's nothing here that caught me off guard or surprised me. Everything was just so monotonous, so just boring and uh, and uninteresting. And there's very little I enjoyed about this thing. Fair enough. Um, My favorite tracks from Plastic Hearts are Nightcrawling, Prisoner, and Midnight Sky. The worst tracks are Bad Karma and Gimme What I Want, and I gave this album a decent six. Uh, my favorite tracks were Give Me What I Want and Nightcrawling. My least favorite tracks were uh, What the Fuck Do I Know, Plastic Hearts, Angels Like You, Prisoner, and Bad Karma. My, and I give this album a light 3 out of 10. Finally, we have Seer by The Smashing Pumpkins. This is the mm-hmm. 12th album from the alternative rock band, and Billy Corgan and co. return with this new album, and three quarters of the original lineup is present on here for this one. <coughs> But for many fans, that doesn't really mean much at this stage. Now, I haven't listened to a whole lot of the Smashing Pumpkins discography. I've only heard Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, which is an amazing album, in my opinion. And I've yet to hear Siamese Dream, but all I know is that past the first few albums, the band went on a downward spiral from what I've been hearing, and a bit of a Billy Corgan ego trip. Uh, A trip that got them nowhere. Now, with this new album, I was curious as to what we'd be getting from them, and... I'm not going to beat around the bush, this album isn't good at all, it's really fucking mediocre. The Smashing Pumpkins this time around go in a synth-pop direction, and it's such a bland take on the sound, It's it feels forced, more like Billy is just doing this for the sake of streams because synth-pops like, re-emerged. <laughs> I had a bit of faith going into this album as the opening track was actually pretty good, but the remaining 19 songs range from being painfully bad to just bland to downright awful. The production is extremely bland with too many moments of poor mixing, Billy Corgan's performances range from being bland to awful, and the songwriting is just some of the most fucking vapid and bland stuff I've heard recently. 
Not to mention, this album is also way longer than it needs to be. It's over an hour long with 20 tracks for fuck's sake. Look, you can argue Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness was way longer, yes. But that album has a direction in mind, and it is interesting in terms of its sonics. This album is just bland, and it has nothing to offer or anything to justify its length. So in summary, this is probably one of the most mediocre albums I've heard all year. I don't think it's worth the trouble. And, yeah, I could see why so many <laughs> Smashing Pumpkins fans would be tired at this stage. Um, yeah, no, this this album just has, it's it's not without any good material, there is one or two tracks that I do enjoy, but it's a complete far cry from what the Smashing Pumpkins once were, and for someone who's a, a massive fan of some of their stuff in the 90s, they were, they're, that era of Smashing Pumpkins is, is what I would consider to be one of my favorite bands, everything past that is just, I don't really even consider that Smashing Pumpkins. Um, the whole synthy aesthetic, you know, obviously they've done the whole electronic twist on albums like Adore, which is a fantastic album. They've done this before, but here it just feels very drab, stale, and, you know, it, I think that the idea here was that, oh, we're going to go on a synth, more synth pop, synth wave, whatever aesthetic, and it's going to be very fresh and enjoyable and new, and everyone's going to be like, wow, <laughs> I can't believe they're doing synth pop, no one's ever done that especially not in 2020. And, <laughs> you know, obviously it's, it doesn't sound interesting, it doesn't sound fresh, it doesn't sound unique. It sounds very redundant, very just stale and boring. And, you know, the song, songwriting is quite unremarkable for the most part as well. The instrumentals are very sparse. The whole album is just so interesting and boring that it in no way, shape or form justifies its length. Um, you know, as I said, I, I hold their projects from the 90s very close to my heart. But the Smashing Pumpkins, I just, I don't really think they're ever going to be the same band again. Even now that all of the original members, except for Darcy, are, are back in the lineup, the band just sounds like a shell of its former self. Um, it's quite sad to see, but it, it's also, you know, not surprising. I mean, it, this this has been something that's been happening for like two decades now. That It's not a very sudden and steep decline. Fair enough. Alright, my favourite tracks from Seer are The Colour of Love, Purple Blood and Adrenaline. The worst tracks are Seer, Ramona, Starcraft, Antos, Satana, Telegenix, Minerva and Schaudenfrud. And I gave this album a light four. Uh, my favourite tracks were The Colour of Love and Ramona. And my least favourite track was Confession of a Dopamine Addict. You know an album is boring when I have... When it's like, what, 20 tracks and fucking over an hour long and I have one favorite, and I mean two favorites and one least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I give this album a strong 3 out of 10. Yeah, seems right. Seems about right. <laughs> and yeah, we reviewed all the albums. Now it's just time to get to our best and worst ones. Uh, I punched We're my mic. Choose... <laughs> don't, be, don't abuse your mic, frustrated. Jesus. You're, you're frustrated that Smashing Pumpkins don't make good music anymore. <gasps> yeah, fucking hell. <laughs> I'm excited to listen to Siamese Dream, though. Mm, for sure. Holy shit. You're in for a treat. Yeah. Alright, so we're going to pick three of the worst albums we've talked about and five of our favorite albums we've talked about. I think we'll do the f we'll do the worst first, and we'll do it the All typical right. way we do it. My number, for my number three pick for the worst, I picked Power Up, ACDC. I chose two sh two chains, so help me God. My number two, I chose Pluto X Baby Pluto, Lil Uzi Vert, and Future. I chose ACDC Power Up. And for my number one, I chose Emergency Tsunami by Nav. I chose Miley Cyrus Plastic Hearts. Ooh yeah, hot takes here. <laughs> yeah, Nav Nav should be happy. He fucking missed the top three. That's, <laughs> that's the best he'll ever get. Ah, poor Nav. We need to stop <laughs> bullying poor Nav. <laughs> when he stops making music. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I agree. I agree. He's given us too much reason to. Yeah, yeah. Just, just read, just read his lyrics. You'll get it. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, we're gonna talk about our best albums. My number five was Spirit World Field Guide, Aesop Rock. Mine was Food House. Food House. My number four was KG, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. 
My number four was Chris Stapleton starting over. My number three was Disco, Kylie Minogue. My number three was William Bozinski, Lamentations. My number two was starting over, Chris Stapleton. My number two was Mochat Duma, Monument. And my number one was Adrian Lenker, Songs. My number one was also Adrian Lenker, Songs. Fat W. Hell yeah. (laughs) So yeah, that's it. We did it. We reviewed everything that we wanted to review from November. And yeah, this is going to be the last recap of the year. Wow, it's been it's been wild ever since oh, yeah. we started this. Yeah, I think. Well, usually January and December are quite scarce when it comes to album releases. And we've got some exciting stuff planned for um, late December. And even like mm-hmm. next week-ish. Um, so be prepared for that. As this channel is, well, this channel, this concept, this this whole cassette tape uh, thing idea was started almost a year ago. And it was. So expect a, a special anniversary video, maybe featuring that. some OG members. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, but anyways, we'll, we'll come back in the new year and we'll recap any releases we might have missed in December. And in January, I already know that there's going to be a new Avalanche album. Ichiko Oba came out with a new album. Um, the Young Blood made a new album. God help us all. <laughs> and so, yeah, we'll definitely have a lot of stuff to catch up on. So. Yeah, we will. We definitely will. And we'll be sure to to give it our best Young Blood. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else coming out this month? This month? Um, Not in terms of albums like what we're doing. I mean, uh, it says that, well, what's the new Brockhampton? Roadrunner is, the date is still set to 2020 on album of the year, but I'm not sure about that. I um, doubt it's, uh, it's not going to come out. I doubt it. It's well, I mean, probably going to come I out next year. I think the Avalanches is the big one. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to ask, are we doing anything else this month? Oh. Does it, yeah. does it rhyme with the, uh, Lapis? Maybe... Maybe it's an award show. Maybe it's a big old award show hosted by your boy Mickey T and your other boy Nostalgia. Maybe it's one where the community got involved and helped us pick the nominees. Maybe it's one where we had a whole collective thought and put into... Well, what am I even going with this? That that was a terrible (laughs) sentence. (laughs) Anyways, expect the tapies soon. Coming to a a theater near you. Well, to YouTube, but yeah. To YouTube, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Thank you so much for checking out today's episode of the Taped Podcast. What were some of your favorite albums from no te- November? November. What am I even saying November. here? November, new month. <laughs> so, yeah. What are your favorite releases from November? What are some of your least favorite releases from November? Our own individual channels and our album of the years will be in the description. The Cassette Tapes Twitter will also be in the description as well. We post some occasional bangers on there. <laughs> and, and yeah, this has been Mickey T. This has and been Nostalgia. nostalgia. Yep. <laughs> Peace. Peace.